Welcome to another episode of The Dap Show. I am your host, Derek Asante, and today I have with me an amazing guest, someone that I actually just recently met, and I'm excited to get to know a little bit more about them. And so that's the beauty of this conversation here. Um, now, I'm going to do my best to describe her, but I think I might slip up here and there and I'll get her you know, to correct me later on in our conversation. But she is a driven entrepreneur. That's something that you can see as, as long as you are online following and if you're not, we're going to get you on that today. She's a business owner as well. There's a lot that we're going to learn about this woman. Uh, she's accomplished so much, both personally and professionally. Uh, she's the owner of the counseling service business, which we're going to learn a little bit more about. I'm not going to give the name away just yet because I need you to stay tuned and pay attention to it and get all the, the nuggets that she's going to drop for you. Um, now, this business, I learned a little bit, a little bit about just by, you know, kind of looking her up online and, and her website and so forth. But I also found out that she's an author. That's where originally I want to connect with her um, about her book. But then I learned more. You know, she had more to offer. And so I said, yes, let's make sure we get her to share her journey with you. And so this is the individual that I'm going to bring on board. Please help me welcome this incredible uh, woman here, Tan Tanasha Smith. Did I get it right? Yes, you did. Yes, Tanasha Smith. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. So with each episode, what I usually do is um, I start off with a quote for each individual. And so the quote that I have for you, I'm going to share it with you. And then I want you to share with me what comes to mind when you hear that quote. All right. Okay. So this quote reads, we will either find a way or make one by Annabel Barca. What comes to mind when you hear that? That's deep. <laughs> I will say that I have surely found my way. Yeah. And some of us get stuck. But it's not that we will never find our way. Mm -hmm. We just need to come in to ourselves. That's it. It's not what's outside of us. It's what's inside of us. Whew. I feel like I'm going to have a counseling session. It might just be about... <laughs> I'm getting the vibe already. I feel like I'm in that sofa, right? I'm getting comfortable. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and I haven't even started yet. <laughs> right? <laughs> just the tone. I love that. I love that. Thank you for that. Now, I want to go back and then we'll make our way to the present day. All right? Okay. So tell me a little about you, your family, and how many siblings do you have growing up? Why, I am the eldest of nine children for my mother. Nine? And that's, and that's all girls. What? Yes, all girls. How, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that I'm, I would be seen as the second parent in the home. Right. Um, having to carry a lot of responsibilities and for them to even look up to me. Um, my father has about 14 that I know of children. Yes. Wait. And so I fall. Oh, yeah. 14. Th sorry. <laughs> Does that include the nine? No. So with my mom, he had three, ch three girls. Okay. And with his separate life, he had 14. Wow. And I am the second, the first girl, second child wow. for him. Are yeah. You, do you know any of the 14? Yes, I do. Okay. I think I think I know all of them. Yeah, I think okay. I know all of them, but we're not close. Okay. Um some of us are on Facebook, but the one that I am close with is the eldest, which is my brother. Okay. And his place is always in prison. As a child, I've always known him to be there. So um, the disconnect is always him either coming in and out. So, yeah, pretty big family. Wow. Now, how was it with the nine? Because you're the eldest. So, yes, yes, you had the responsibility. Did you how close are you with the other eight? Um, <laughs> the one after me, we <laughs> fought like. I wouldn't even, I, I, the term I would use cat and dogs, yeah. but we fought. We fought a lot. Yeah. She never listened to me. Mm -hmm. um, 
today we are closer than we ever were before as 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 children but for the rest i am not close with any of them they look at me as a parent so they feel that they need to um prove to me that they are adults in some kind of way um because my mother was very even though she was there she was very absent Mm. so i played that mother role to That's them right. so which you, is not it's not cute no no no, no <laughs> yeah no. yeah it almost sounds like you lost out on being a big sister oh not almost i did yeah completely i oh did gosh. yes wow. completely um i've always wanted that sister who would be like oh my gosh i went you know this place and i had this experience right um i did have one sister though that you know disclosed her first boyfriend to me I felt like a million dollars because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is sister, sister talk, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> it's it's not her looking at me as a mom. Yeah, and yeah. and that was it. I don't have any, um, you know, that sister conversation. Now today with the, my sister who's after me, yeah, we have a great conversation and okay. she's, a, she's now grandma. She's a grandma before me. Right. So I'm now learning from her. And when people see us, they keep thinking she's the one who's older than me uh, and I'm younger. And I'm cool with that. I'm yeah, great yeah, yeah. with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cool with that. That's a plus. But, um, Take that. Yeah. Yes, that's a plus. <laughs> she's, she can be my big sister in the light of those who don't know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I've always, I've only known to be responsible. And with that comes with a heavy burden of never having to let go and be a child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would you say were some of the benefits, even though it was challenging and you Mm -hmm. lost out on those moments of being a sister, but what would you say were some of the benefits in how you were raised or how you grew up? I used to regret being the eldest child, but now I am so happy that I am because not only am I super, super responsible, I am, you know, I'm very, I, I don't depend on anybody. I'm independent. I I don't need I don't need to be told what to do. I just already know what I need to do. Mm. So when I look at sister like number six, I'm just like, woo! If you only <laughs> listen when I told you to wash the crates, you didn't listen, right? <laughs> it's just like I don't want to be an adult. Right. So that the benefit is I I my survival mode. Mm. I had to learn as I got older. I got to turn it off because I'm not there anymore. Right. Um, the benefit of knowing that I'm street smart. I, I just get the the way that life should be when it comes to being a mom, especially. Mm-hmm. It came easy for me right. it, to the point that my husband was shocked that he said, did you do this before? I'm like, wow. no, I have never given birth to a child. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but because being the eldest child, yeah. the responsibility, you just ha- I had to know. I had to know what I had to, to know what to do yeah. in order to protect them and to feed them. Um, show up at parent teacher night meeting like I did it all as a teenager before I became a mom would you besides the fact that you were the eldest sister and you had to take on that responsibility early on would you change anything just hearing the benefits I'm, I'm curious to hear if you would change anything besides that part yes what I would change is the fact that if my parents were present, Mm -hmm. I would be able to enjoy um, my childhood, enjoy moments with them, instead of having to be the one who is Mm -hmm. the discipliner, um, you know, micromanaging and all that stuff that I, I did not want to do, but I had to do for the safety of Mm -hmm. them. So I wish I had enjoyed my childhood just a little bit more. I can imagine that. I'm thinking about your parents. I'm thinking about your parents as you're speaking. How would you describe them? Like, well, let's back up a little bit. Let's say, how old were you when your father was not in the picture? I'm assuming since he had the 14 other Mm -hmm. siblings for you. Well, well, let's say you, you can be raised in a home with both parents Mm -hmm. and a parent still be absent so um he was around because he his his uh lifestyle he was a hustler 
he was always on the streets. And so him popping up would be any, any given time. Mm. I had him around me from, I probably would say from, I was a little, I was born, newborn until about, I would say seven years old. Yeah. Seven years old when my mother had to actually leave the environment because he almost killed her. So she had to take custody of us. So I, from from birth to the age of seven, I had him actually in my life, coming into the house, being somewhat apart. But he was he was a good cook. He mm-hmm. was an awesome cook. He can cook anything and turn it into gourmet. Like oh, he wow. was awesome. He taught my mother how to cook. Um, he was he was the one that was the <laughs> he was the fun fun person to be around. He was the light of the moment. He was the one that got everyone laughing and enjoying themselves. And in that same breath, he was also that scary person that can just switch and turn it off. My mother, she was 18 when she had me. Mm -hmm. So he's about, he could be about six years older than my mom. And so she had me at 18 and she looks like 18 even when she had her fourth child. So her walking with four children at the time living with this man they looked at them as like the most amazing couple she was quiet well put together Uh, my mother is the last child and the only girl for her mom wow and so the dynamics of how you know she is as a person and him being the eldest of his family of 18 wow okay 18 brothers and sisters is a totally different, and they're they're both Jamaican. <laughs> yeah. Hold on, let me just let me just gloss over that. That's <laughs> you're coming yeah, from a family of, of nine. Your dad had yeah. fourteen others, and what? Yeah, fourteen. And I was told, and I was told that eighteen is probably not even the correct number. It's probably more. Wow. Yeah. I can't even imagine. What do you live in? Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In Back Jamaica to... too. In Jamaica. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My gosh, that's a huge. Yeah. I can't even wrap my head. Like, my, I hear my mom talk about you know coming from like 12 and I've heard families of 16, but that's like way back mm-hmm. when I, I, that's mm-hmm. how I imagine it. Right. But my gosh, that's like one generation away. And that's a lot. 18 is a lot. Yeah, it is. That's it a is. Long I, and, and it's different, <laughs> it's different women, different women, but I don't yeah. think much. Yeah. So it could be about three. Right. <laughs> right. So, it's, it's, oh, so wow. yeah. So it, it's a lot. It's a lot. Man, I've, I've, I've met majority of them, but not all. No. Yeah. yeah. What what impact? I mean, I'm thinking you as a young girl growing up and, you know, the dynamics of your parents as you described it, what impact did they have on you? I'm trying to figure out if if you got some of the the great parts of your parents and what were those parts? Oh, <laughs> I did. I got the I, I got the best part of what they did not utilize. Mm. I got the parts of them where they didn't trust the parts of them that they feared to show up in life. My mother was a go-getter. Anything that she puts her hands on, she can manifest into a masterpiece. Nice. But the problem with her was that she never finished what she started. Mm. My father, I only know him to be very intelligent. My mother, what she lacked, she was, she had a disability with reading and writing. Mm-hmm. Um, by the time I was born, I, she couldn't help me in school. So I had to teach myself how to read and write. And so my father, he was more educated, but he was never around. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what he was good at because he, nev- he, he was good at cooking, but I don't know how much more he was good at, right? right? Which I, I know for sure that I probably have his intellect because females have their father's intellect mm-hmm. and the boys have their mother's. Um, when it comes to when I show up in the world, I know it's more so of my father than it is my mom. Mm. Um, but when I when I have to face my insecurities 
in a sense that I feel that um, I'm less than and I'm not enough. I know that's coming from my mother mm. having to be a mother at such a young age, having to fight for herself, having to go through so much trauma and never speak of it. Wow. And so the thoughts that we tell ourselves, right, that we're not enough. Yeah. Now, you said something that struck me. Um, daughters get their intellect from their fathers and sons get them from their mothers. Is there anything you can share with me about that? Because I'm, I'm curious to know a little bit more where that comes from and how you came to that. Well, with with just me and my curiosity, try, I'm always trying to figure out my family, mm -hmm. the roots, how we come from, and even how we're developed in a way that how we go after life. And I'm the first in my family to finish high school, oh. college, and university, right? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand if I... If my mom couldn't help me how to read and write, mm -hmm. then how, why do I deserve to even go the length that mm -hmm. I'm that I'm desiring? And so I started to realize that I don't take after her in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. But because I don't know my father's performance in school, mm -hmm. just by you know his ignorance, I know him as. I realize when. I show up in the world. I, I, I feel it inside of me that this has to be my dad. Right. I feel like I am performing in my dad's genes of some sort compared okay. to my mom, because I've only known her to be very depressed, very miserable, isolates herself. And she never takes chances. Mm -hmm. I know my father's a risk taker. So after having my children and realizing how they developed, I realized that my son takes after me to a T in a sense, his personality, his intellect. Um, he's a visual learner like myself. My daughter, who takes after her father, so much to the point that they think alike. Oh, it's wow. scary to watch. <laughs> it is really scary that I had, I had to learn. I've learned so much more about my husband through my daughter. Mm. So men struggle a lot with expressing their emotions. Yeah. And, and so she struggles when she has to express her emotion. I'm like, how is that? How, how is it that this child is so much like her father? Right. right? But you can't tell her that. She says she's exactly like me. Yeah. But I've done, I've read books and I've, and I've listened to documentaries on, you know, just the development. And even in school, I had to learn the development of a, of a child how when the baby's born based on the mannerism and the behavioral mm. and how they adapt and how they take after their bloodline. Right. Mm. And so I, I start to look at everyone in my family, look at how my grandmother responds when she's showing up as her best self versus when she's uncomfortable and thinks she's not enough mm. very much like her, her daughter, her daughter shows up that way, right. but I didn't get to know my grandfather, mm. her father, right? How he showed up in the world, right. but I only heard stories. So I look at the generations of how they were intellectually, intellectually and their behavior. Right. I study behavior very, 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 very much in the sense that the nonverbal is what I pay attention yeah. to. Not much the words. Yeah. Yeah. Because how we how we respond, and that's why I always tell people, someone could be depressed, but you can never know how, how bad they're doing. Yeah. Because we all look the same. Yeah. We all do the same. We continue to work and continue to smile and do what is accepted in society. So I say all that to say that I've done a lot of reading and I'm, I've looked at my genetics mm -hmm. and being a mother has helped transform me into seeing things at a whole different level yeah. and also encourage me to break the cycles of what I know with my family and what I now want my children to no longer to learn, to unlearn. Yeah. So it's, it's not just healing me. I've done a lot of work to break some generational cycles of behavior, especially. That work is never easy. It's not. It's, it's not easy. easy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, because that, that, that really stuck out to me because 
I'm paying attention to my daughter. Um, she's seven. And mm -hmm. I do see a lot of me in her. And I see a lot of my son, um, my, 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 son, my wife and my son. So yeah. that's why I'm, I'm, that really stuck out to me because I'm thinking, hey, I thought it was just me, but I'm glad there's something. I'm going to have to look yeah. into that a little bit more too, you know. Yes. Um, I'll pick your brain about that. <clears throat> now, <laughs> no problem. so you have a 16 year old, right? Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to go back when you were 16. <laughs> how far yeah. off are we as far as how your, your, your daughter response to the world that you did in, in your time like who who was tenacia in high school well i was a very quiet 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 student i never spoke in class i never put my hand up i was so quiet i was i was born in a time where you're to be seen and not heard and my mother put me in a catholic school where she wanted that because she's come from Jamaica where everyone wear uniforms. So she just thought it made sense that I went to Catholic school. A lot of people and thought that And there too, wasn't. Right? Oh, yeah. A lot. A lot of people. And I don't know if it's like my mom who just thought, you know, uniform it is and that's what we're going with. But that was her, her way of thinking it's best we go Catholic because you wear a uniform and I ain't got to buy no extra clothes. Yeah. You know what you got to wear, yeah. right? Yeah. And having to see my not see myself show up in classes, there I can count on one hand the amount of black kids that were in school. Mm. And so because I couldn't read in grade one, grade two, they made sure to just push me on because I was silent. Mm. I didn't misbehave. And so it's like check mark, she passed because she listens, right? In high school, um, I was so quiet. But I was a walking time bomb. Really? In a sense that I had so much anger in me uh, that I didn't realize how much anger I had in me until I fought. And, well, and I... Sorry, yeah, what were you angry about? I, I couldn't tell you back then what yeah. I was angry about. Yeah. But I was angry because my father, you know, having to leave mm. my mom the way he did you know, destroying us as he did with having to abuse her physically. I was angry when my mom wasn't available for me. And by the time I got to high school, I was already um, molested maybe three times already. Wow. Right. So I, I had ang just this anger. And then I didn't really have a, I didn't have a social life. Wow. So as soon as school was done, I had to be home because you have to take care at of a the certain other hour because I had to take care of the other one. So I didn't get to wow. mingle, you know, go to the movies, go to the mall. I don't know anything about that. That's I don't know that kind of life. Wow. So when I when I see my daughter, I always say to her, you know, I'm jealous of you. Yeah. I'm really jealous of you because this life I don't know. I don't yeah. know this life. Yeah. Can't yeah. relate to this yeah. life, but I'm helping to give you this life right. that you're living, and so. Every time as she as she got older, I didn't do it with my son because he's a male, but as she started to talk and start to share what's on her mind, all I kept thinking was, who was I when I was her age? You know, was I so vocal? Yeah. And so as she got older, I'm always marking myself in a sense, what were you like at 16? I was nothing like this child. She's working. She's a competitive dancer. She's a straight A student. She's so highly competitive that she competes even with herself. My her father and I never tell her, you know, you gotta bring in good grades. Yeah. No, she's she's hard on herself. So she doesn't even give me room wow. to be that to her. And at her age, I was battling with my image. I was battling with suicide. I was battling with having to run away from home. I did not like myself i didn't like where i was living at that time i was living in rexdale um i had i had to fight in my home just to survive when i had to face my abuser but then when i left my home i also had to fight because there was girls in the neighborhood who didn't like me just because i was a, a pretty girl and a lot of students that i had to work with in the years of service of being a teaching assistant i 
met students who are like, why do they hate me? And I said, because you're beautiful. And I'm like, here I am telling yeah. this child the yeah. same thing an adult told me and I couldn't believe it because it just doesn't make any sense. You yeah. just hate someone because they're pretty. Yeah. And I didn't even like myself. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't like who I was. Wow. That's, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing that. You, no I had problem. no idea that was in the backstory. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So how do you get through high school with everything oh. happening? High school was my safe haven. It was a place where my name wasn't called to wash the dishes, to change the diapers, to cook and prepare food mm. for my siblings. So when I got there, I was so present that I did not, yeah, my escape, I did not want to hear the bell for when 2.30 for me to get on that bus to go home. Yeah. What? And it was struggles. Go for it. Yeah, it was struggles just to get up in the morning because I struggled with my um, I have iron deficiency. So mm. to get up Good after day. a long night of staying up, I am exhausted. Yeah. And then I get to school. So my absence was horrible by the time I got to grade 10. Wow. I had to take three buses out of Rexdale, Jamestown, to be <laughs> to be real frank, Jamestown, yeah. to get to St. Michael's, um, oh, St. Bathurst. Saint Mike, no, no, yeah. my, um, there's two of them. Okay. So it's St. Joseph, St. Joseph P Michael Power School. I don't know why oh, that was yes. the name. Yes. So they then called it Michael Power. Yes. And yeah. so I had to take it, take three buses just to get there. Wow. I didn't go to the schools across the street like West Humber yeah. or Marion Academy. My mother sent me out of, out of the area, and I'm and I'm grateful for that yeah. because I would have had to face horrible days in school. I probably wouldn't have graduated if I had to attend the schools in the area. Isn't that interesting how that works? My mom did the same thing with me, where she had me go outside the neighborhood, but my brother stayed in the neighborhood, and we're total mm. polar opposites. Yeah, right. And I find that yeah, I'm grateful for that too. That's. It helped because you got exposed to different cultures, different people, different, you yes. know, different experiences, right? And and that shapes you. And before you know yes. it, you're an adult and you're like, oh, I've, I've, I've you know been around Italians before or mm -hmm. uh, Koreans or Asians, and and so now you're familiar with how to navigate when you do meet people of of that culture. Whereas yeah. when it's just you and your own people in the same you know box, you're not exposed yes. to anything, so you're extremely ignorant the minute you step outside of that box and. Now you're right. going back into the box. And so a lot of people get stuck there. And and to your point earlier with the quote, you said, yeah, like people, you know, we get stuck. Some people get stuck in, yeah. in the neighborhoods mostly. But yeah, that's what did you what did you want to be professionally when you were in high school? If you can if you even had that dream, like what was it? I did. I did. My dream came to me when I was. 11 and a half years old wow. just about to go in because my birthday is late so I started school um, when I was 11 and a half almost 12 mm. and and so when my dream came to me I still remember the dream to this day very detailed I'm, I was sitting I'm in the room <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear this you remember it yes. so vividly great Let's do yes it. <laughs> yes and let me correct that it's 12 because okay. Yeah, my birthday's late, so 12 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember the dream. I'm in this office space. Um, the lights are dim. I got hardwood, mahogany furniture. And there's this paint, this person, it was a male, sitting on the chair. But he wasn't sitting. He was kind of like lounged. Mm -hmm. And the chair was that old time, you know, those old time um, couches with the... Um, buttoned yeah, yeah yeah in in the in the sofa yeah, yeah and so it's leather and it's nice and brown and i'm sitting in a very cozy brown chair myself mm -hmm. and he's just sharing his problems to me and the phone rings and my friend at the time was the receptionist and she says whoever i had a crush on at that time that was the last thing she called me so she said miss ashita which was this italian boy who was my neighbor and she wow. said miss ashita uh we have a client here waiting for you and like she said your 11 o'clock is here and i said thank you and she hangs up the phone and she can i continue to have this person speak to me and 
I'm now in the dream looking and thinking, what is going on? And yeah. why are people here to see me? Right. And what am I doing for this person? Yeah. And I remember waking up and telling my grandfather the dream. And he says, well, my dear, that sounds like you're going to be either a shrink or a psychiatrist. And I was like, what? I don't want to, it just, it just yeah. didn't sound right. I'm like yeah. a shrink. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> right. And so I was so determined that this dream came back to me. It's almost every day I thought about this dream. It felt so real. And I remember going to the library and just researching. Mm. And I didn't like what it said to be a shrink. I didn't like the the, the definition of yeah. it. I didn't like the definition of the psychiatrist. I'm like, why am I giving medication? I don't want to give medication mm. to people. I want to help people like me. Right. And the, I was led to look into social work and counselor, guidance counselor, and social work was the fitting title. Mm. And let me tell you, I took that title and I'm like, this is what, this is what I'm going to be. Only for my guidance teacher to tell me I can't be that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, mine was yeah. an old white lady. I can't stand them. I really, I, yeah. I, I can't. I was told, uh, not to, uh, a sidebar, just because I got triggered mm-hmm. as, you, as you said that. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because, yeah. Because I wanted to be um, an animator. Like, I wanted to learn how to animate. And wow. she says, no, you need to know how to do math. And math was not my strong suit. So I said, okay, well, that's not true because animators don't do two plus two. They literally draw. So I said, how does that make sense? So she ends up mm-hmm. directing me towards programming, coding. That's what she thought animation was. So I ended up oh. going from high school. I went to uh, Centennial for like a month and I realized I was enrolled in programming, not animation. And so wow. I was just like, this was hell because that's not my world. Mm-hmm. My mind doesn't work that yeah. way. So I just said, nope, before OSAP comes at me with this, you know, you owe us an arm and a leg. Let me give them mm-hmm. back their money and get out of Dodge. So that's exactly what I did. And then I figured out, oh, she just didn't know what she was talking about. Yeah, she didn't know. And that's, so that yeah, just reminded that's me sad. of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of us that's triggered that way. A yeah. lot of us. Yeah. And what bothered me was because this counselor, he used to give me lunch money because my mother never gave me lunch money. Mm-hmm. So to see someone that I trusted yeah. to look at me and tell me that I couldn't be yeah. Yeah. something that I was only good for being working with. He said, it's best that you work with senior citizens. Wow. Um, that would probably be today PSW. Mm-hmm. And not to say it's a bad job, but yeah. why do you think that you get to now choose for yeah. me? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wow. That's a crazy, awesome dream, though. Like, to have it at that age, and mm-hmm. here you are living it, but we're going to get to that. That's Thank you yes. for that. That's, man, you are like Wonder Woman right now. <laughs> <laughs> you killed wow. me. <laughs> now, what what made you stay motivated during this period where you're transitioning from high school into post secondary? Like, what was your motivation at that point? I be- I believe looking back now, my motivation was always caring for others, which would be my siblings. Mm. I put ev- I used to put everybody before me, before my needs, and so my as long as I was helping someone to do anything in their life, and it was always to help motivate them to be better. I kept going. Isn't that interesting? Because you're in somewhat dark spaces as far as things that you're dealing with yet you still find the drive and i guess because you were able to give somebody some light that kept you going because now you felt like you had a purpose am i am i jumping too far like i had a no exactly i thought i my purpose was in helping those Mm. who are around me and so if i made them feel good or even took away the pain within that moment Oh wow! I can do this again. Mm. Let me let me keep going. Let yeah. me keep trying. Yeah. And is is that still your motivation today? Or has I have love you helping developed... people? Yeah. But I've developed boundaries. Yes. Some serious boundaries. I was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> some serious boundaries, and you know, 
when you are a survivor of sexual abuse, there there are so many layers to um, the self esteem, mm-hmm. the confidence that it's like you never you didn't get, I didn't get to know who I was. Mm-hmm. I didn't get to develop a sense of who I thought I was in as a little girl. So because my innocence was taken from me and my my happy moments, my fun, I was forced to grow up real fast. And so to hide my shame and my guilt, I figured why not just show up for others the way that I actually want people to show up for me. But you know what? It just feels better that I make sure that I, I cook the food. I wash the clothes. I comb the hair. Mom asked me to do anything. Yes, I do. I never say no. And so when I got older, by the time I got to college, I realized, okay, she's actually manipulating me and taking advantage of me because I don't say no. And I started to realize, you know, my father is never, ever going to show up for me the way I wanted him to. Mm -hmm. And neither is my mom. So I need to shut this down now. It didn't happen within that moment. But because of the teaching that I was receiving in college of family dynamics you know, how, how we function as human beings within our environment versus outside of our environment. And I'm reading these books and I'm like, oh no, I have to shut it down. And so it was painful. It was painful to say no. And there was times I had to learn the lessons over and over and over because the closer the blood, Mm. the harder it is to let go. Right. And so when I realized that I had to choose me, I still got to learn it again. So every sister that I have, I had a season of learning a lesson mm-hmm. until I finally cut the cord. That's eight seasons, eh? By the way, people, if you're listening, that's oh, eight yeah. seasons. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, but you know, it's funny you say that because I find that to be one of the most liberating moments when you're able to say no to like your parents or the closest ones to you. Yes. Because I yeah. learned it hard as well for years. Same thing, just, you know, I don't know if it's a cultural thing. Um, but Mm -hmm. it's definitely one of those things that, you know, we find it very hard. Children of our parents, we find it very hard to say no to them. And, you know, we're adults and we're still finding it difficult to say no. Sometimes we'll slip up and say yes, but, you know, just being able to say no for the first time is freeing. I think that's something that, you know, a lot of people need to try. It's a culture thing. It's a culture thing for some of us, but it depends on how we were all raised. That's true. And so I'll speak for the Jamaicans because that's where my roots is, right? So Jamaicans have this thing where, you know, I gave birth to you, Mm -hmm. so I own you, Mm -hmm. and you shall do what I say. I am the parent, you are the child. And so until we start to realize that they're just carrying on the same generational Mm -hmm. cycle. Yes. Yes, you are the parent, but now I am my own big woman. That's it. Right? (laughs) And I get to say no, because what you're doing, I do not like. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 Oh, man. Talk to me about the book. I think Once Broken, that title, it feels to me like it was, like it's intentional, like it's it's meant to move people. Because it does have that, that feel to it. Once Broken, and now it also offers a a great curiosity about it because what are we talking about that's what it did for me i'm I'm thinking what is this book about i know what she does professionally i wonder if it's connected but i feel like it's also not just a learning a book a tool to use but it's a part of your story and i haven't gotten my copy yet i'm gonna order my Mm -hmm. copy after this conversation because i want to know what it's all about i don't want you to spill all the beans but i'm curious What's the story behind the title? I had a feeling to the, like, there was a feeling in me that no matter what I try to go after in life, something would hit me and take me down. Mm. So my image was that I was broken in so many pieces. And every time I try to put the pieces together, it would just break again. Mm. And so what I then then put that image was the brokenness came from when someone robbed me, stole my peace, my happiness. He broke it in that season. He broke it for me. But what I have done is made myself whole again. 
It gave me reasons to live. It gave me purpose. It gave me a voice because I lost my voice for many years. Even before I was sexually abused, I lost my voice. Because in a time where I felt that I wanted to fight for my mother, I was too small. Mm. And so to protect myself, I decided I'm just going to go mute. I didn't speak. Mm. So it was me now looking at this title and saying, you know what? You actually thought you would never be able to vocalize not only your story, Mm. but to even stand in your power and own own your space on this earth. Mm. You never thought it. So you once thought you were broken. Mm. So that's how I came up with the title. Oh my gosh. Now you guys better pick that book up ASAP because I'll give you the link to in the <laughs> description when we, when we finish with this. But no, it's, it really struck me. And I'm, I'm curious, what would be some of the takeaways um, from once broken that, you know, will, will be provided for the readers? Like what, once I pick it up, what am I going to take away from it? What, what's it going to do for me? What am I going to get from it? If you can help me out with that. Well, for sure, some life lessons, because in each chapter, there's life lessons that I've learned along the way that I explain that, you know, that I hold to, to this very day. What you're taking away is me- mental health looks different for our black community. Mm-hmm. And sexual abuse is never spoken about. It's always put under the rug. It's, it carries shame. It carries guilt. But only the victim carries it. And so everyone plays a part in helping someone who's experienced this. But when the story is shared, they all turn their backs. There's no one there. The only person standing is the victim. And so I I write this book to give voice to those who thought they lost their voice. I wrote this book to uplift those who thought their light doesn't deserve to shine. I wrote this book because healing is available and it is real as long as you want to do the work to face the truth so that you can walk into your power. Now that's extremely powerful because I want people listening to this episode to recognize that what she just said is not just about victims of sexual abuse. This is for anybody who feels like they're not enough. That's what I'm getting from it. And that, that really excites me because that tells me that anybody can pick up this book. It's not just, you know what I mean? Like I I don't want it to be, pitching hold into just being about victims of these, you know, horrible um, situations, but it's for any and everybody who's in a, you know, a, a tight situation, a dark situation mm-hmm. going mm-hmm. through either it's depression. Um, and that's the thing with mental health that I'm learning more and more every day is any one of us can ca- get it or have an experience or an episode of it at any point. It's almost like I, I, I guess, understand it as being kind of like a migraine or a headache or a flu, uh, you know, a runny nose, you can catch it. You may be able to get through it with, with help. Um, and sometimes it stays a little bit longer for some of us. Right. And, and sometimes it goes from maybe the runny nose into a fever. So it might be a mild case of this, but without Mm -hmm. treatment, it could lead to something much bigger. Oh yes. Right. So I'm learning more about it. Um, and, but you said something that's really interesting that mental health looks different in the black community. Can you share one or two examples of of what that would mean or look like that that we can have an idea of what that means? Well, you know, our blood runs real deep as far as, you know, slavery, colonialism. And when we look back on how we had to hold our tongues and we had to take the pressure and within every generation we carry those traits and so we never want to express how we really feel because one we already have to face society and the impact of what they and how they put us out there and how they make us feel and how we have to show up and so within workplaces within marriages within families when we don't feel good Instead of us saying, you know, I'm not feeling good right now. I'm going to go and lay down. We walk into the house carrying everything that's on us. And we show up stoic. We have this face of 
emotionalness. There's no emotions whatsoever. And we carry on in this life every day the same way. And we refuse to acknowledge mental health. We don't want to use the word depression because it's like a disease. We feel like we need to be in the madhouse. So it looks different for our Black community because we still got to educate everybody. We still got to let them know that you're seen, you're heard, you de- you're deserving, you're loved, and you too matter, yeah. right? And and it's not it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. And so my passion is to always drive the, the fact that self-care is so important because our Black community, we're forced to feel that we got to work hard, we got to hustle, we got to bring in the money, we got to make sure we have what we need, but there's no softness. There's no, all right, let's take it back a little. You know, we accomplished mm-hmm. something. Yeah. We don't even look at what we accomplished because we're so, we're so you know, st- strung hard on making sure that we're showing up and we're, we're doing what's right and following the steps. Yeah. But we don't take, a, take the time to take a breath and be like, wow, let me sit back and just enjoy this for a little. Yeah. We're just ready to be back on the grind again. Thank you for that. That's... <laughs> You hit it right on the head. <laughs> you hit it right on the head. It's going to shake a lot of people with that one, and I appreciate you for sharing that. Where can people get a copy of this book? It is available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it's It's been two two years now. Yeah, two nice. years. Nice. So I'll make sure the link is in there. Um, I'll also include her IG contacts later on so that you can get it and then make sure you connect with her and maybe get it signed because we all know. Yes, the I would be brings. more than welcome to sign. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, now, how how do you define broken? Like if you have to define it, how do you define it? And how does a person know if they are broken in order to begin that, you know, that healing process? Well, I'm going to say because the book is called Once Broken, mm-hmm. And none of us can ever be broken. Mm-hmm. We, it's the thoughts that we bring to ourselves and make true. It's what we think we become, right? And so doing this work for over 18 years of social work, um, I've come to realize that we only lose our power if we give it away. Mm-hmm. And that means losing self-control. So if you don't have self-control and you feel like you need assistance in Waking up in the morning, you need assistance with now someone helping you prepare your meals. This is where it's gone really bad now because you've lost sight of who you are. Mm. And sometimes the reason why we lose sight of who we are because we're afraid to ask for help. And we look to others to validate how we're feeling. We also compare ourselves to others to see if we match up to what they are. But we don't, we're not, you know, we're not looking inward right? We're not trusting ourselves because we rely on all the resources that are outside of us. It's scary though, because I know a lot of people have lived for so long hating who they are because of what others have been telling them or feeding them, right? Whether it's images or just, you know, family members telling you're not good enough or friends. And now you're saying, I have to be able to love me before I can get you know change my mindset before i can get what i need to get out of this life yeah that is difficult is that where you come in try to help people kind of get back into okay okay so that leads me to my next question Mm -hmm. (laughs) right because what is the difference between a registered social worker and a non-registered well A registered social worker is covered by the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers, which means you're protected under this college. Mm -hmm. And for the practice that you run and and I guess also workplaces that you work under, you have to follow the code of ethics. Mm -hmm. And it's just like doctors. You know, once you sign up to become a doctor, well, not sign up, but go to school and graduate, you now are under a licensing. So registered social worker is a licensed social worker to practice mm. psychotherapy if they that's they, if that's what they choose or to work with an organization that provides counseling for those who are seeking psychotherapy services. Okay, that's important to know because I wasn't sure. And so, because you hear people say I'm a social worker, but 
when I when I read your bio and I saw registered, I said, like, wait a minute, that's a new word before the words social mm-hmm. worker. So I'm curious if yes. this. And so that makes a lot more sense. So, folks, if you're mm-hmm. listening to this again, pay attention to the details because it's going to make a difference as to who you're, you know, um, getting help yes. from and, and how qualified if they have that liability uh, coverage with that school, the university and, and right. so forth. So that's what you want. You want to make sure that person's actually who they say they are and they have all the qualifications. Mm-hmm. So very important. Yeah, it is. It is. Thank you for that. Cause that's, I was curious about them. Like registered. Yeah. I've never heard that. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of people just use it because yes. they went to three years of schooling and said, oh, I'm a social worker and that's it. Right. Right. So what now I want to focus on you um, and, and the services that you provide since we're on that. So if I'm if I'm somebody that's seeking some sort of help with my mental health yeah. and or my self esteem or something that's happening with me, and I reach out to you, what are some of the services that you might offer um, to different people? It may not be um, specifically to me. I, I kind of want you to share the different you know services that you provide and when they reach out to you. Okay. Well, the first thing we do first is a consult. Okay. I need to know if I am the right fit for you and what you're looking for, if I can give it to you. Because everyone has different training. I am I use CBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, mm-hmm. and Trauma-Informed Therapy. Also um, EMDR, which is Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing Therapy. Mm-hmm. And that is all to do with trauma because I specialize in sexual trauma, per se. It's not that I don't deal with anxiety, mm-hmm. depression, um, cu- uh, couples therapy, individual therapy based on workplace issues, mm-hmm. right? Racial trauma. There's a variety of ways of people that come to me. But what I offer, I always tell them my main focus is self-care. Mm-hmm. So I could be so fancy doing all these therapies. But what I'm going to teach you is to take care of yourself. Because you can experience death, you can experience um, an illness, Mm -hmm. you can be going through issues at work. If we don't know what we need to cope, we're just going to continue the same cycle, behave the same way. What what purpose does that serve? It doesn't serve any purpose. We're We're not fixing or healing anything, right? So I always tell my clients, when you come to me, you already got all the power. I'm just going to guide you how to maneuver your power. You've wow. lost it along the way. Maybe you forgot a little thing here and there. You have everything that you need. I am now the investment person who's now going to take you on that journey. And we're both going to work together to make sure that you have the tools when you're at work and somebody's all up in your face. When your boss talks to you and mistreat you, you know how to respond. When your husband is a narcissist and you don't even understand how to communicate, I'm going to teach you how to take care of yourself, right? It's at the end of the day, I always tell my clients, I'm going to teach you how to love you to the point that you remember you and show up for you before you show up for everybody else. Masteryofselfinc.ca. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you need to go, okay? That's where you need to go so you can connect with her because that is... It, it's funny you mentioned CBT because I did that years ago. I think it was 2004 mm-hmm. or five, where I was working with younger um, kids in grade... I think they were in grade four or three. No, four or five. I can't remember. How old are you when you're in grade... They were, they were 10 year olds, right? That I was so working grade with four or five. Yeah. Around there. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was very, very powerful. Cause I had to take a few courses just so I can be in that space with the professional. Mm. Right. So I was more like assisting the lead, um, but they needed a male presence. So that's why I was there. Cause majority of the group uh, were young boys. And so it was very, very, very insightful. Like I still kept a lot of the books that I have and I go through them every now and then because I'm realizing that doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. Mm-hmm. It's still applicable, right? These are the things. Yes. That, so that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because it kind of took me down memory lane a little bit with those mm-hmm. good old days. There. Yes. <laughs> now, again, mastery of self, um, Inc. Ca is the website. Now, 
I mean, you, you explained it. My next question was going to be, why did you establish it? But it's clear, right? It's clear you, you help people get where they need to be. And, and that's what it's about. Yeah. Now, what makes it unique is that you focus on the individual, right? And I think that's not as consistent as I, I would like to perceive it to be because a lot of times we focus on the things around the individual and how they can try to yeah. either um, align with it or, or navigate it. But I think you're right. Starting from the internal and working our way out you know, to the external is more important because now I know I'm, I'm, I'm grounded. Now I know who yeah. I am and I, I can decide for myself now, okay, does this impact me? Do I let it impact me this way or not? Can I walk right. away? Can I say no? And that's the other thing, like teaching people how to even say no. Mm-hmm. That changes the world. Like, yes, it <laughs> it's does. a game changer. Like people yes. don't know how to say no, especially to friends that they've, you know, say to themselves, oh, I've known this person for 20 years and I don't know how to say no to them. Well, yeah. that's not really a friend. If they mm-hmm. don't understand how to navigate around, no, coming from you that you've known for 20 years, you know, right. so that's, I'm glad that's, that's what this is about. And thank you for that. Now, you're welcome. your website, yes. you stated on there and I love this, but it said, uh, the transformation begins when the work on self is applied daily. Yeah. What is one thing that somebody can take away? Listen to this episode that they can work on daily, like an, an exercise or an activity or something, um, uh, a suggestion or a message, anything that you can share that they can take and do on a daily basis. I'm really asking for me, by the way, just. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we go through different seasons and we, we transform based on where, our, where we are in our lives. And so I always encourage my clients to tell me, what do you like doing? Oh, well, I don't do anything. No, no, no. What do you like doing? Okay, tell me when you were a little girl or a little boy, what was your favorite thing to do? Oh, I love to do puzzles and I love to draw and I love to paint. And so when I go back to when they're little and they said to tell me all these things that they enjoy doing, I said, okay, why are you not doing them now? I got time. Oh, okay. So when are you going to make time? Because this is serious. I was telling this is a serious step you're taking with me because I'm going to hold you accountable. So the things that bring you joy, the things that make you smile, the things that make you feel good is what you're going to put in your daily practice. Mm -hmm. Because when you lose those sight of those, you go into a cycle. I'm not enough. I don't deserve. I don't get enough sleep. I'm unhappy. I can't take this life. I don't want to be here because you're not filling your cup. You know, the saying: make sure you don't, use an empty cup or use out the empty cup. I always tell people when you fill that cup, you're filling it for you first. You're not filling up for your wife. You're not filling up for your children. And I tell people, everybody's got to have boundaries, everyone, because if you don't create healthy boundaries, that means everybody gets to use up all of your energy and you're left with none. So a daily thing that I do I have to do my affirmations every morning. I got to fill my, I got to fuel myself up. Right. And after I do my affirmations, it's either I do my morning journaling or I do my night journaling, but journaling has to happen because that's what saved me to continue my life today. So learning to journal is people always think that it's a difficult thing because they never had to apply it yet. They never had to take the chance to write their thoughts on paper scientifically when we use pen and paper both sides of our brain is operating at the same time could you imagine how much power comes out in paper when you're using both sides of your brain and so there's gratitude journaling there is venting journaling when you just release all that's happening in your days there is you know journaling where you want to manifest there is forgiveness journals there's so many ways of journaling that is for me but making sure that you drink your water, making sure that you're eating what you need, making sure you're not missing a meal, make sure you're taking time out to breathe. Breathing is part of my practice. It's part of what I concentrate on most out of everything is because we don't take time to just pause mm. and breathe. Bringing oxygen to our brain centers us. It's the first thing we do when we enter into this world. 
And so just by going by your day, we're just barely taking an air, barely taking an air. And within the time that you're at work or wherever you are, you are becoming anxious, you're getting irritated, you're getting angry, you're getting hungry, you're getting stressed. And we have yet to say, okay, I'm going to take five minutes and just go sit down and breathe and, you know, come into myself and center myself and just be. So breathing, yeah. intentional breathing is very important. That's a few. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> no, what, I'm, I'm and, taking yeah. them all. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. The journaling I used to do, I haven't been doing it. So I think that's one that I'm definitely going to pick back up. Um, and the breathing yeah. I just recently started just because of uh, recent health uh, scares that I went through. So thank you for mm. sharing that. I, I didn't realize how important it was until another yeah. individual shared that with me and said, you know, just try just, you know, focusing in on just your breathing and, and seeing mm -hmm. what it does for you. And it does. It does clear your head. It does, it does. allow you to just actually release a lot of tension, just sitting calm yes. and still and just being still. And releasing yeah. the pressure. Yeah. You know, yeah. blood pressure runs in yeah. the black community high, 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 yeah. right? So yeah. it helps to release the pressure. Wow. So I'm, I'm curious. Um, we're coming closer to the end and uh, I want to know what else do you want to influence with your capacity whether through your book or your services what else do you want to you know influence how else do you want to impact people I I want to be able to help especially young people I love young people <laughs> I love helping the youth. And the reason is, is because when we we're teenagers in high school, that's the period where we're trying to figure out who we are. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to fit in, in a group. We're trying to not to fit in. We're trying to figure out who we want to be, how we should show up in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I always encourage my, my young people to just be yourself, be yourself. Parenting has a great impact in this time of growth Right, how you speak to your children and and how you show up for them is very, very important. So I want to help parents parent. There's no right way. They have the methods. They just need to be taught how to connect with themselves and their child. I want to show up for those who've been sexually abused. I want to be able to have speaking engagements, um, run groups for those who, who are survivors. Um, I want to be in, I want to be able to create what well, I am creating now, a self-love journal where it's intentional for you to release your daily stresses and to be grateful and to also manifest um, throughout your weeks and your days. Um, I also want to be able to finish my audio book, nice. which is almost done because this story, as much as, you know, it's called Once Broken, when people hear the backstory or even just the intro of where I've been through, like, Oh my God, like yeah. it's too heavy. It's yeah. too much. It's, ooh, yeah. it's hot, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so <laughs> I want people to, I want people to get comfortable because I enjoy having uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. It's my strength. And so to be able to talk about sexual abuse as if it's, it is alive and it's not dead to, mm -hmm. to bring voice to, those who've lost their voice yeah. to bring healing to people who are ready to step into their power. I want to be able to show up in the world fearlessly on a, on a, on a pod, like I'm <laughs> tongue, tongue tied <laughs> on apologetically and to make sure that people understand that we are all one. And if we just, come to realize that if we take care of ourselves, if we take the time to take care of ourselves, this place, this world will be so much better. Man, that was so beautifully said. Thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, 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 it's amazing because the more you speak, the more I realize, Oh, like you are for real, like this is what you do, right? Because I can hear it, the yeah. calmness in your tone and just the way you approach, um, you know, what it is that you're trying to deliver and, and everything else is pretty clear and it's to the point, but it's not, it's not harsh. If, if, yeah. if you know what I mean, like it's digestible, it's easier to accept, it's, it's welcoming, you know? So yes. 
I definitely take some skills to do that. And I appreciate you for that. So we're at a segment in the show where I shake things up a little bit. I'm going to ask you a silly question. All right. All right. So it's a would you rather question. Okay. Would you rather get a paper cut every single time you turn a page or bite your tongue every time you eat? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Both of those are like horrible. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to go with the paper cut because I have a high tolerance of pain. So paper cut it is. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so you can manage that yes. pain over... Yeah. Your, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, goodness. So I like to throw that in there when the conversation is very heavy. Um, yeah, Just to kind of lighten it up a little bit. Um, now... <laughs> We're coming to the end. If you yeah. could improve two areas in your life, what would they be? Oh, improve two areas. Oh, wow. Yeah. This one's a toughie. I know. Because I, I look at things as I had to go through them to learn the lesson or I had to, I just had to do it. If I could change two things or improve two things, mm-hmm. it would be the relationship that I have with my mother okay. and my father. Mm. Yeah. Nice. I would, if I had a relationship with those two beings, and I'm sorry because I'm just so deep, but mm. <laughs> I, I don't even bring it to another <laughs> kind of thing. But if if I had a relationship with those two human beings that helped bring me into this world, I probably would have been 10 times ahead of myself of where I am today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And, and so I had to, I had to learn to parent myself. Yeah. So if I had them as parents, I would have shown up. <laughs> yeah. A whole no. lot different. It's interesting too, because you can, you can play the other side and say, if you did have them in the way that you would have liked, you would have also been slightly a different person. Parts oh, of yeah, your character definitely. trait would have changed too. So it's interesting. Yeah. It's almost like you don't yeah. want to say I regret, but I'll take the best parts of it. Right. Yes. And yeah. Yes. Yeah. What's next? What's next for you? Because you got a lot on your plate. I can only imagine if there's something else. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned the the programs and everything else. So that's what yeah. you're you're going to be doing, I'm assuming, right? And so in three, Yeah, i mm-hmm. go for it. Go for it. I I want to be able to well I'm not be able i'm gonna say i've already connected with some other professionals to do retreats i i i as a woman it's hard for me to 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 stand in the presence or even to say that you know for black men who do not have a strong voice out there Mm -hmm. they need the support just as much as black women Mm -hmm. and so coming together with professional men and professional women and creating a retreat that gives impact for them not only to leave with but to practice at home. Do it. Do yeah. it. Do it. That, Do that, it. Yeah, that that's that's the yeah. that's the next thing because our, our our black men, and I'm not saying other men out there are not suffering, but it's time for them to show up. It's yeah. time for them to stand up and they have it in them. It's just that they need support systems that are going to allow them to vocalize one their emotions yeah. and to trust themselves so that they can trust others. Yeah. And it's really what you're describing too is the lack of safe spaces. To yes. Have those There's not enough of those. No. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think that's, and that's for men in general, right? But I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking about black men. So yes, it's not a lot of safe spaces because the minute you say it, you, you already know, you mentioned some of those stigmas that we deal with as parents that we got from our parents. Right. So in yeah. the culture, it's just these things that are there and that we need to work through and, and get over because it's it's not it's not easy because we get it when we're young boys. We get the messaging, right. we get the messaging and, you know, the repetition is ingrained in you. So it becomes who you are. But you can undo mm-hmm. that. It just takes time and work and obviously the space to allow that to happen the space 
Yeah. Now, could you share an important life lesson that you've learned recently with us? That I get to choose who I want in my in my life. Mm. And I get to choose friends, I get to choose colleagues, I get to choose acquaintances. I get to choose family Mm -hmm. because a lot of the times growing up, I felt that I had to um, keep a certain way just to keep the peace and keeping the peace means also to keep secrets. I don't like secrets because I had to carry one for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So my life lesson is that I get to choose. That's the first I've heard that. That is the first time I've heard that. But choice is essential. Yeah. Wow. Other than and other, everybody's got it. Yeah, but we just don't exercise <laughs> it as much as we. No, we should. don't. Yeah. Wow. Other than your book, what is the most recent book you've read? This oh, is gosh, this I is where I many. cheat because I'm I'm building my own book. <laughs> book collection oh, right? so, okay <laughs> so when i get okay. a good book i go and get it and make sure i add it to my collection yeah the one that i'm reading now is the viola davis oh, book i got the audio yes 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 i didn't get the audio. i got the physical because i just felt like this one's a keeper well, that's um, the thing. I had to get it to. <laughs> now I have to buy it because the audiobook told right. me I need to get the book because I'm I'm a person with the book. I usually start with the audiobook and then I get the book. Oh, okay. Because I want to okay. enjoy it now, and then I get the book and I actually make notes. So my books, I try not to lend out because I've written all over them. I take yes, whatever okay. nuggets I get. I highlight. I write, and I have a little notebook with me every book that I read, and I actually write quotes or statements that resonate with me. I write them in that book, mm-hmm. so I have kind of like my own little Coles notes that I walk around with. Yes, right? so, I'm starting to do that now that I love to listen to audiobooks because yeah. the one that I'm listening to is called The Anatomy of Energy, oh. which is just crazy amazing. I um, that into that one, yes. Nice. Because I, I, I read into energies very quick, mm-hmm. um, any space that I go into. So this book is now, it's fueling me in a sense that not only am I owning, you know, my gifts that I have, because we all have special gifts, mm-hmm. but I'm now able to know, learn how to use my energy to benefit myself, mm-hmm. knowing when to shut down certain energies that carry toxic toxic. Mm-hmm you know, entities yeah. around them, mm-hmm. people who come into your space. I'm able to manage what I no longer want in my energy field. Yeah. So that book is very, very interesting. Nice. I'm going to check that one out. Thank you for that. Yes. Now, how You're can, welcome. How can others connect with you and learn more about you and the, the healing journey that you are providing, the support initiatives that you are, you know, going to be spearheading? Um, like even the, the the retreat, right? Anything that you're about to do or you're currently doing, how can people connect with you so they can support it or become a part of it or, you know, fund it or anything like that? Well, they can follow me on Instagram, which is mastery underscore of self or on Facebook, mastery of self. I don't like social media, but <laughs> because it's so draining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I'm trying, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm trying my best. (laughs) But if I post anything, if I'm doing anything, that's where they can find me. Awesome. And the website is for business services. So make sure you get to that. That's yes. Mastery of Self, um, Inc.ca. So make sure you check that out. I also have it in the description. Now, when it's all said and done, how would you want to be remembered and why? I want to be remembered as the person that showed up for herself and taught others how to do the same. Done. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh my gosh, that was awesome. I want to thank all the listeners for joining us this week for this conversation. It's been an honor. For me, just because I learned a lot 
and I'm going to learn a lot more because I'm going to continue this relationship and, and make sure I tap in and, and connect anybody that I know with you just so they can benefit from it as well. And I hope that anybody that listens to this episode, either, you know, in the future, um, that you gained a lot from it, not just from our conversation, but you got to look at yourself and reflect a little bit and recognize a lot of the information that, you know, my guest here shared with us is applicable and how you can actually do a lot of this stuff um, just by simple things that you can do on a daily basis, like journaling or breathing and things of that nature that she shared with us. I want to thank you again for just blessing this show with, with your presence and your energy and, and the wisdom that you shared with us. And I do hope, and I'm going to definitely, you know, push people towards that website because it is beautiful, by the way. Um, It's an exceptional, uh, very well, well laid out and it's clear to the point. All the information that you need is there and definitely connect with her on social media so they can get all the updates that she's sharing and grab that book, right? Once broken, Amazon link will be provided for you as well. So until next episode, I want to thank you again. Love, peace, and nappiness.